Let's read the book of Joshua, chapter 18, shall we? Uh, I'll read. Actually, somebody else can read if you want to. There are a lot of Hebrew names here. I know Harry Neal wants to do this really badly, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off and not have him do this. <laughs> he, did, he did a great job with, Joshua, with Genesis 25 the other night. Truly did. Great job. Okay, so Joshua 18. Uh, would anyone like to read? There are, truly are a lot of Hebrew stuff in here. Okay, fine, I'll do it. Okay, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. By the way, I'm reading King James. It might read a little differently than what you have. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land? which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you. Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise, and go through the land, and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coast on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. Ye shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description hither to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And the men arose and went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it and come again to me that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven parts in a book and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. And the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families. And the coast of their lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. And their border on the north side was from Jordan, and the border went up to the side of Jericho on the north side, and went up through the mountains westward. And the goings out thereof were at the wilderness of Bethaven. And the border went over from thence toward Luz, to the side of Luz, which is Bethel, southward. And the border descended to Ataroth Adar, near the hill that lieth on the south side of the nether Beth Haran. And the border was drawn thence and compassed the corner of the sea southward from the hill that lieth before Beth Haran southward. And the goings out thereof were at Kirjath Baal, which is Kirjath Jerim, a city of the children of Judah. This was the west quarter. And the south quarter was from the end of Kirjath Jerim, and the border went out on the west and went out to the well of waters of Nephtoah. And the border came down to the end of the mountain that lieth before the valley of of the son of Hinnom, and which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom, to the side of Jebusi on the south, and descended to Enrogel. And was drawn from the north, and went forth to Enshemesh, and went forth toward Galiloth, which is over against the going up of Adumim and descended to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben, and passed along toward the side over against Araba northward, and went down unto Araba. And the border passed along to the side of Beth Hogla northward, and the outgoings of the border were at the north bay of the Salt Sea, at the south end of Jordan. This was the south coast. And Jordan was the border of it on the east side. This was the inheritance of the children of Benjamin, by the coasts thereof round about, according to their families." Now the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, according to their families, were Jericho and Beth-Hogla and the valley of Keziz and Beth-Arabah and Zemaraim and Bethel and Avim and Parah and Ophrah and Shephar Hamonai and Ophni and Gaba, twelve cities with their villages, Gibeon and Ramah and Beeroth and Mizpeh and Shephira and Moza and Rechem and Urpiel and Terelah and Zila and Elaf, and Jebusi, which is Jerusalem, Gibeath and Kirjath, fourteen cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to their families. 
So we're going to start back at the beginning here, look at a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think there's a tendency when we read God's word to kind of disregard sections like, this is the inheritance of the tribe of Benjamin, or disregard um, uh, uh, the uh, genealogies. You just sort of kind of pass over those. I'll read First Chronicles some other time. There's 11 chapters of genealogy. But I just want to point out, everything in God's word is important. Now, whether you understand its importance or not is another matter. Whether it's important for your practical life right now is another matter. The fact of the matter is, it is God's word. Every word is there for a reason. Um, we may not always understand, we'll actually talk about this a bit later, we may not always understand everything, but it is still God's word. The fact that we don't understand it makes it no less God's word. So, just wanted to point that out. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about, I, mean, I hope you can see this um, enough that maybe you can see some of the names, but this is the promised land and the divisions of the tribes. Um, I don't know if you guys know uh, the sons of um, Jacob, which were the 12 tribes of Israel, but he had two wives, Leah and Rachel, right? You can read about this in like Genesis 30, 28 to 32, something like that. Um, Leah, one of his wives, gave birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. They were the first, these are in birth order. This is the order in which they were born. And then Bilhah, Leah's handmaid, gave birth to Dan and Naphtali. And then Zilpah gave birth to Gad and Asher. Zilpah is Rachel's handmaid. Okay. And then finally, Leah again gave birth to Issachar and Zebulon. And then Rachel gave birth to Joseph and died giving birth to Benjamin. Okay. She died in childbirth. And the reason I'll point these out to you is that we looked at the fact that the half-tribe of Manasseh, up there at the top on the east side of Jordan, that's Manasseh, Joseph's son, and Ephraim, Joseph's son. They were born in Egypt when Joseph was over Egypt. Those were his sons there, but they effectively become tribes. And there are 12 tribes because Levi um, there, he doesn't get an inheritance. So in terms of the promised land being divided up, there are really 12 tribes. Even though there are 13 names there, there are 12 tribes because Levi, the priesthood was his inheritance. They did get some cities that they kept their livestock in for sacrifice and taking care of the priestly duties that they needed to do. But they did not get a distinct land inheritance. They didn't do that. So that's how the exes are the ones that had already gotten an inheritance. We saw um, in Joshua chapter 1, actually, how the half-tribe of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben on the east side of Jordan got their inheritance, right? And Judah down here at the bottom got his inheritance, and uh, Joseph, the other part of Joseph, got one up north, I think, as well. Ephraim, uh, up a little north, right about in the middle, just north of the Dead Sea. <clears throat> so the other seven names there that don't have red X's, those are the ones that are going to get inheritance now. Okay? So that's a little bit of what's actually going on in this chapter. This process started in Joshua chapter 13. It extends through Joshua chapter 19. You can imagine this took a lot of time. Um, not only did they have to, I mean, we're talking about um, a million people, probably, a million and a half, something like that. Um, in fact, let's look at, let's look at Joshua chapter, one, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh. Just that part there involves them going from Gilgal which was the headquarters, you may remember when they crossed the Jordan as a whole body of believers, right? A million, million and a half, million and a quarter, something like that, come across the Jordan River. They go to Gilgal. They settle at Gilgal. Um, Gilgal, interestingly, let's look at a couple things here. Uh, let's, Joshua 4.19, And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And then in Joshua 14, 6, then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. For, so for the first 10 years, uh, eight, seven or eight years or something like that, during the conquest time in the book of Joshua, Gilgal was headquarters. Okay? That's going to change now. <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 5, verse 9, just point this out to you. We read this. This was, perhaps you remember, the chapter when the whole... Um, 
male congregation of those males who had grown up in the wilderness but not been circumcised in the wilderness, which it tells you why in Joshua chapter 5, why they had to be circumcised because they weren't circumcised in the wilderness. That whole congregation of men is circumcised, right? You may remember the expression, the hill of foreskins. There were a lot of men. But it was at that time, Joshua 5, 9 says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. That's what the word Gilgal means, roll, rolling. Okay? That's what Gilgal means. A verse you may or may not be familiar with, which is, has the root word of Gilgal, which is a great verse. I kind of, it's kind of a favorite for me. It's Psalm 37, 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also him, and he shall bring it to pass. The word commit is the root word of Gilgal. It means to roll. You roll things on the Lord. <laughs> you don't carry them. You roll them on the Lord. That's what commit means. <clears throat> so everything had occurred in Gilgal up to now. Now it changes to Shiloh. Why Shiloh? Um, we, I think, most Christians nowadays sort of identify Jerusalem as the... Um, uh, kind of the home city of Judaism, of Israel. It was actually not Jerusalem until the time of David, which is another 500 years, 450 years after what we're reading about in the book of Joshua. Shiloh was where we'll see the tabernacle was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. For the next 450 years, until the time of about Eli and Samuel, <clears throat> and then Saul's the first king, From about, it was about that time that Shiloh, that the Philistines actually took the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle was destroyed, um, and that's when, in David's time, things start to shift toward Jerusalem, but it's not until then. Shiloh is their, you know, capital city, so to speak. So why Shiloh? Uh, first of all, I just want to point out Deuteronomy 12, 11, because this change from Gilgal to Shiloh apparently happens without God telling Joshua do this or do that, or at least not that we read about. Okay? But in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11, it's safe to say that um, God guided Joshua to do this, otherwise he, otherwise he would not have done it because of Deuteronomy 12, 11. Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows, which ye vow unto the Lord. So we don't read about God saying to Joshua, okay, now take everything over to Shiloh. We don't read that. But based on Deuteronomy 12, 11, there must have been some divine guidance to do this because we're talking about Gilgal to Shiloh. Shiloh was on a mountain. Shiloh wasn't convenient at all. Um, it was sort of in the middle of the country, um, and it, there's a mountain range in the middle of Israel. So it was not, it, it was not chosen... Uh, would not have been chosen because of convenience, because it wasn't a convenient location. <clears throat> but Shiloh means rest or tranquility. It's also a title of the Messiah, which we first see in Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This is within Jacob's... Um, last um, words, so to speak, and he, it's, it's sort of him blessing his children. And this is in Judah's blessing. Um, so Shiloh meant rest or tranquility, and you'll notice at the end of verse 1 of chapter 18 of Joshua, it says, and the land was subdued before them. The fighting part, which took, again, five to seven years of taking the promised land, that was over. So now... Gilgal was the war camp. Shiloh was now going to be the capital, right? Shiloh, rest, tranquility, and that at least hint of the Messiah. And then uh, let's look. The fact that he set up the tabernacle is the next thing we're going to look at because it's the first thing he did. Now, um, the tabernacle, which we'll read a little bit about, very little, not a lot. The tabernacle was God's dwelling place 
but it was temporary. You may be familiar with the temples, okay? Solomon was the first one to build a temple. Solomon's temple was just magnificent, although, unfortunately, if you read about the life of Solomon, it was not as magnificent as Solomon's house was. <laughs> In any case, Solomon builds the first temple, okay? That's destroyed. Ezra and Nehemiah build the second temple. Then Herod, which, we, which is what the temple we're aware of in the New Testament, Hemp, Herod builds the third temple. Okay? There's going to be, you know, that's going to be reinstituted um, when Christ returns or toward the end time events. But those are the three temples that kind of biblically are present. Right? So the tabernacle, according to Exodus 29.42, this shall be a continual burning, burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. There was a purpose for the tabernacle. That was where God met the people, often with the physical presence of a cloud, you know, he would, or a, the Shekinah glory. He would directly be there to talk to the children of Israel. <clears throat> and let's look at, um, we're just going to read a little bit of this. Let's look at Exodus chapter 25. The description of the temple, I'm sorry, the tabernacle, um, takes up from Exodus 25 to about 30, 31, I think, and then um, most of through chapter 40, 35 to 40, um, describing the materials to be used, how it was to be constructed, dimensions, in very specific detail, very specific detail. So let's just read a, a portion of this just to get a flavor for it. Um, and I'm going to ask somebody else to read this because the King James can kind of put you off because it uses King James English. So would someone be willing to read a little bit in a newer translation? You, um, let's read... Uh, that's fine. Let's read chapter 25, verse 10 through uh, maybe about 22. Verse 10 through 22 of chapter 25. Thank you. So, as you can see, and you can read, continue to read about how the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were constructed out of what materials for, again, through most of the end of Exodus. Now, the only thing I want to point out to you is about this um, is the actual, well, the actual tabernacle as an area was not very large. Not very large at all, especially when you consider that the congregation in this case was over a million people. The tabernacle itself, in terms of dimensions, was not big. It was a tent, for heaven's sake. It was designed that it was designed so that when the children of Israel got up to move in the wilderness, they could take the tabernacle with them. It wasn't a permanent structure. It wasn't until the temple, Solomon's temple, that God had a permanent structure. The tabernacle was temporary. Um, and it was where God met the people. 
in the city of Shiloh for the next 450 years. Okay. Interestingly, uh, we'll come back to the temple a little more, but interestingly, in the New Testament, the, tabernacle, the word tabernacle is only used twice, and both times, guess what it refers to? 2 Corinthians, whoops, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 5, 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, it refers to our human body. It's only used one other time, and that's in verse 4 of that same chapter. Both times it refers to our human body. I'm not drawing any conclusions, but um, if the tabernacle in the Old Testament will, was where God met the people, uh, and the only thing it refers to in the New Testament is your body, uh, maybe that says something about where God's going to meet you and, and uh, how we should care for our physical bodies. Um, now, I don't know if you can see all of this detail or not. This is an example of, of the tabernacle. Okay? The, it had a perimeter. It had an, an, a bronze altar for bird offerings. At this, this one right here, it had what is really kind of the precursor to baptism. It had a bronze basin of water for the priests to wash in. It had a holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was in the very front of that structure. It had a holy place, which is in the, in the back of that structure. But this whole thing was maybe 75 feet by 100 feet, and the tent was even smaller. And the, the tribes of Israel were camped in a certain order, certain locations around this tabernacle. They were specified as to where they were going to be. They had a specific place to be, and that's where they stayed, okay, when they were all around the tabernacle. So while the, um, while the tabernacle was intricate, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't huge. It wasn't, I mean, you wouldn't be awed by it. it mainly, uh, the thing I take home from this is, first of all, the fact that Joshua set it up first thing, that communication with God, with, with God was the most important thing and that worship was the most important thing for his congregation. The first thing he did was set up the tabernacle and put the Ark of the Covenant in it, number one. Number two, you know, we all need that place of worship, but it doesn't have to be glorious or magnificent. I mean, we have a great church, but I think probably people wouldn't call this magnificent or glorious. But it's a place of worship. That's all we need. You know, the tabernacle wasn't huge. We're t <laughs> they couldn't begin to get even the rulers of the people of Israel in the tabernacle. It was way too small for that, for this group of people. But that didn't make any difference. It was where God met them. We'll talk about the Ark of the Covenant in a minute. Why don't everybody stand up and uh, greet somebody, shake hands, say hello, take a few steps, walk around. Introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. You can leave it open as far as I'm concerned. It's up to you, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so let's pick it back up. Uh, one of the things that was in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about this in one other chapter that I shared on before, but I just want to kind of refresh your memory. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, that's a representation of it. As we read about in Exodus uh, 25, it was made of acacia wood. It was overlaid with gold. Some parts of it were pure beaten gold, but all of it was overlaid with gold. Okay. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention about the tabernacle, I don't know, for those of you who are in the building trades, I guess maybe it applies a little more. Um, but, uh, and the temple was the same way as well. Um, there's a record regarding the building of the temple that talks about God inspiring the workers, the people who worked intricately in wood and stone and so forth on the temple. And if we do something workmanship-wise for God, he should be proud of it. 
we should be able to put our name on it. And he'd say, you know, that's a good job. Like the tabernacle or like the temple was. Because God has very specific instructions sometimes. Um, and cares about the details clearly, or he wouldn't take the time to enunciate everything in 10 chapters in Exodus about how to build a tabernacle. He'd just say, make me a tent, put some poles up, we're good. But he didn't do that. He said specifically what had to be done, specifically what it was supposed to be made of, specifically how it was supposed to be made. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, just, just an offhand thing, um, God can, in your life, give you very specific revelation. He can tell you very specifically what you should do because he does that all through his word. What we just read, specific instructions. Make it out of this wood, make it with gold, do this, do this, do this, do this. He can do that and will do that if necessary. But please remember, 99% of the time, the instruction you need is the written word. You don't need to look further than that 99% of the time. So I just encourage you, um, the written word and the revelation of the written word is by far the more important than looking for signs or looking for additional revelation. I'm not saying God doesn't give it. I'm only saying the written word should be our priority. When the written word is our priority, God can go beyond that. If the written word is not our priority, God's not likely to go beyond that. Okay, so... Um, Exodus 25, 10, 11, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. We just read this, so we're not going to read it again. Um, it did contain the stone tablets. Uh, the Lord mentions that in what we read. It also contained a, uh, an amount of manna and also Aaron's rod that budded. We're not going to go through that, but um, that's a great record. Aaron's rod that budded. That's, what, that's, that's another thing. It's also called the Ark of the Testimony. So that was in the Holy of Holies. So life lessons, you know, the place of worship I mentioned. Um, Corporate worship is important. That is a church. I think nowadays, you know, there are a lot of advantages to computers. There are a lot of advantages to the World Wide Web. One of the big disadvantages to it is that people think they don't need to physically be present anymore. And that's a problem because we really do need to be physically present. Now, in many cases, it is simply not available for someone to be physically present in a location to be, for example, in church or here or something like that. But when it's possible, it's really important to do that. And sometimes I think we miss that by clicking the mouse and just watching it online because it's more convenient. <clears throat> um, a, a place of worship, as I mentioned, does not have to be big or glamorous. And the workmanship of what we do for God, like those who build, you know, the tabernacle, or those who build nowadays, um, he should be proud of what we do. And that goes for not just like building a building. I mean. Things, your work every day, that's workmanship. Um, how we take care of our personal lives, that's our workmanship. Uh, all of, the Lord should be, be able to be proud of what we do. Okay, now let's talk about, uh, I just want to point this out to you, and I will tell you that I don't fully understand what we're going to look at in God's Word right now. I don't fully understand it. But, as I mentioned earlier, whether I understand God's Word entirely or not, does not make it any less God's word. It is still there. It is still important, even though I may not understand its fullness. However, um, let's look at uh, verse, let's see. Verse 6 of Joshua 18. You shall therefore describe the land into seven parts and bring the description hither to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. So let's talk about casting lots, because that's how this land was divided up. Okay. So in Joshua 18.10, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their division. Right? We read in Numbers 26, this is well before anything in the promised land had happened. Numbers 26.55, notwithstanding the land shall be divided by lot. According to the names of the tribes of their fathers, they shall inherit. Okay? So it was supposed to be by lot. And then in Exodus 28, 30, this is the kind of lot that they used. The, word, the, the Hebrew word that is most of the time translated lot is the word stone. Okay? So we're going to read Exodus 28, 30. This may be something you're not real familiar with. However, again, it's God's word. I thought it would be good for you to know. Exodus 28, 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, 
That's the breastplate of the high priest. Breast, this is what he, a garment that he wore here. It had precious stones on it to represent the tribes of Israel. But then inside the breastplate, there was a, a pocket, so to say. Breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. When he goes in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. So our understanding of the Urim and the Thummim, which is, those are Hebrew words. I mean, they just, they didn't even try to translate them. They just put them in the English translation, right? Urim and Thummim. We don't completely know what those were. However, let's look a little further. Other scriptures that relate to it. We looked at Joshua chapter 14, and these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. Now notice there are Eleazar's there. He's the high priest. He would have to be there in order to use this Urim and Thummim to divide up this land. This was essentially a way for the children of Israel to know about God's will. And this was, uh, you can see this throughout the Old Testament, we're not going to look at all of it, but you can see this throughout the Old Testament, up about to the time of the kings, when the office of a prophet comes, and then God's will was more communicated by way of a prophet, not by Urim and Thummim. Okay? But these lands, when, and you'll read about casting lots, you may remember, um, well, well, we'll look at it, but it occurs in the book of Acts with the 12th disciple when Judas kills himself, right? I don't know if you remember that or not. They chose Matthias and Joseph, and it says the lot fell on Matthias. They were casting lots. Now, at that point, it probably wasn't Urim and Thummim, but it was the same idea as that. Urim and Thummim, it's, there isn't a documented use of it after about the time of Ezra. But they cast lots to determine God's will in Acts chapter 1 after Jesus Christ ascended. So this is a, you know, it is a biblical thing. Uh, I mentioned that the Hebrew word for lot is the word stone. Um, in, interestingly, the expressions that are used when it talks about a lot, it'll use the word, it came up in, ex, in uh, Joshua 18.11, or that it came forth in Joshua 19.1, or that it came out in Joshua 19.17, which again, it was a drawing out of one of the stones apparently from this pouch in the ephod of the high priest. So they would essentially have a portion of land and they would somehow pose a question about does this tribe get that portion of land and they would draw a stone out and whatever stone they came out was yes or no. And that's how the land was divided up. That's how God's will was revealed at that time. And the, re the, uh, the reason I wanted to point this out to you is that my guess is it was really foreign, it is really foreign to you that you probably didn't know about this at all. But it is in God's word and you see it again and again and again. And you see it in Acts chapter 1 as I mentioned. You also see it when David's going to go to war. He just flat out asks God, should I go up and fight these guys? And the answer is no. They did that by Urim and Thummim. They drew out a stone. Was it yes or no? And God revealed his will that way. And that's how the land was divided in this case. In the New Testament, in Acts 126, and they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, in Acts 126, it's possible they were voting that I mean, versus casting a lot, but nonetheless, casting lots is, is very evident biblically. Now, I don't think we're going to read this whole thing. Um, this, if, if you want to print onto this, I can give it to you. We don't have to use, read the whole thing, but it gives you more background on the Urim and Thummim. Um, let's, um, let's just read the very last paragraph. The Old Testament seems to indicate that the Urim and Thummim faded from use during the early days of Israel's monarchy and only are only referred to once after the Babylonian exile. This may be so because the institution of monarchy got inaugurated because with the institution of monarchy God inaugurated the office of prophet. The prophets now participated in God's heavenly court and communicated God's messages to the courts in Jerusalem and Samaria. Apparently, prophets who revealed God's word to the king replaced the Urim and the Thummim, through which he revealed his mind to the priest. Nevertheless, we still find Ezra using this device to determine the ancestry of the priests who returned from the exile in Ezra 2.63. After this, the Bible never mentions the Urim and Thummim again. God did not preserve it for his people. 
They are one more allowance from God to assist his people at a certain point in history. So that's how, when we see Joshua cast lots for the land, which you see again and again and again in the chapter we're reading, that's what was actually happening. They were actually getting a yes or no response by drawing this or that stone out from the high priest would from the ephod, and they would determine what area of land a tribe then occupied. The, the specific borders, like that's why Joshua in this chapter, he says, now go out and make a list of the cities. They would get a specific section of land, but the specific borders were worked out as they determined size of the tribe and the land and the quality of land and all that stuff, which is why it took so much time. The settling of the land took, of, of the time of the book of Joshua, the 17 years, 10 of it was just settling the land. Five to seven of it was fighting to get the land. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but the life lesson is, you know, when we read cast lots, I don't understand Urim and Thummim. I don't fully understand why God did that that way. Um, but it's no less God's word. It's no less God's word. And therefore, it's still important, even though I don't fully understand it. <clears throat> and that understanding God's word in general, um, it just takes time and attention. Um, I think... I was reading a book a uh, long time ago, but I reread it every once in a while. It's called How to Enjoy the Bible. It's written by a fellow named E.W. Bullinger. And um, he talks about how the Bible interprets itself. Right? So one of the things he first says is the biggest reason people don't understand the Bible is they simply don't read it. Right? They just don't read it. Most Christians, if you ask them, they simply don't read the Bible. And if they read it, they read it infrequently enough and little enough that they don't have time to understand it. And they don't read it uh, throughout. In other words, they don't, they don't get any context of New Testament or Old Testament. They have no context. So again, I will just go back to what I've said a number of times when I've had the opportunity to share God's word here. The best kind of Bible research is simply read the Bible. Just read the Bible. Get on a reading plan. Three chapters a day. There's only about 1,000 chapters in the King James Version of the Bible. Three chapters a day. You can read the whole thing in a year. Get a chronological Bible if you want to do that. Something, but read the Bible. So I really encourage you to do that. Uh, we, I don't think we're going to do that. I, I'll describe that to you, but I don't think we're going to actually watch the video. Um, that is a video that I actually downloaded from YouTube, but I'll synopsize it. Um, relative to not understanding everything in God's Word. That video is by a scientist who talks about the nature of light, right? Like light. Okay. So just by way of reminder, light was the first thing God made, right? And all he said was, let there be light. That's it. That's all he said. So there was light. <clears throat> so that video portrays in a couple of minutes, he talks about the fact that we still don't understand what light is. We've done experiments to figure out that it's a photon, which is the smallest particle of energy and indivisible and doesn't deteriorate. But we also do experiments when light behaves like a wave. But it behaves like a photon if we look at it that way, or it behaves like a wave if we look at it that way, or it does both, which they call the light duality. Bottom line is, after 6,000 years of human history, something that God made the first day with a phrase we don't understand. So the point being, if you don't understand something in God's word, don't panic. Just keep reading. Just keep studying. Time, attention, and God working in you will get you an understanding of God's word. So just keep at it. <clears throat> and then I wanted to mention a couple of things about being uh, what Joshua says in verse 3 um, of chapter 18. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? <clears throat> now, clearly, based on that verse, there was some resistance to actually taking possession of the promised land. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said that. you got to remember, this whole generation grew up as nomads. I mean, they hadn't had a settled place. They grew up in the wilderness. They were going from place to place to place to place to place. They go to the promised land. They're fighting for five to seven years to conquer the whole land. They haven't had a sit-down, like, 
village, city, anything like that, that isn't the way they lived, right? So there was some resistance to that. <clears throat> and the thing that I thought about uh, relative to the New Testament is the same way that many times uh, we do things with our knowledge of Christ. I thought of the Galatians when Paul says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You have freedom in Christ. You know he's your Savior. You know he's freed you from the law and freed you from sin. And yet you're willing to go back to the other stuff. You're willing to go back to what you did before <clears throat> and sort of freshly crucify Christ. And, and uh, a great analogy in 2 Peter 2.22 um, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I mean, the children of Israel in this case, after they fight tooth and nail for the promised land, they're not willing to actually take possession. And how many times has that happened to us with respect to the rights we have in Christ, and yet we you know, go back to the old ways? I mean, we go back to doing what we did before. Maybe with the same people we did it before with. It's like a dog, you've probably seen it, I have in my lifetime, like a dog going back and eating his own vomit after he vomited up. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Humans do this, Christians do this all the time. When they come to a realization of Christ and then turn back to what they did before. They don't renew their minds. They don't, um, are, are not transformed. Uh, that quote from Second Peter is from Proverbs 26, 11, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Again, so often, that's what Christians do, like what the children of Israel did in the book of Joshua. Um, let's read these verses again. We looked at these when I think I taught Joshua 12, but I want to actually read these because the slackness that Joshua talks about in chapter 18, verse 3, it's not only evident there, it's evident in the fact that the children of Israel did not drive out the people, the Canaanites, like they were supposed to. And let's look at these. Um, we'll just look them up individually. Get them all here. Um, could, um, Mike, could you look up Joshua 13, 13? Danny, could you look up Joshua 15, 63? Eddie, uh, can, you, uh, can you read, Eddie? Can you, can you see to read well enough? Um, look up Joshua 16.10. Jeff, would you look up Joshua 17, 12, and 13? Um, somebody want to look up Joshua 23, 12, and 13? I don't know, whoever. Okay, Harry Neal. And then um, I'll, uh, actually somebody can look up Psalm 106.34. So let's go from the start. Um, whoever had Joshua 13, 13, Mike? Fifteen sixty three. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Okay. Sixteen ten. Jeff, you, you had 17, 12, 13. Did somebody look up Psalm 106? Yes. Okay. This is not the story of the nation. Concerning whom the Lord commanded. Go, uh, 
if you would, go ahead and uh, keep reading, Michael, and read through uh, about 39. Thank you. So from Psalm 106, you see what resulted from the other passages we read when they didn't cast out the people like God specifically told them to do, right? Um, just imagine for a moment with a generation that witnessed all of the things that happened in the wilderness and then come into the promised land. Just imagine for a moment that they begin turning to idols. Because that's, we'll read about that in Joshua 24. That's actually what happened. But then in the judges period, you see this kind of undulation of obedience, disobedience. And it's a reflection of what they didn't do, what God told them to do that they did not do to get the people out of the land in the first place. And they did exactly what Harry Neal read about in Joshua 23. They intermarried. They started worshiping their idols. Just imagine for a moment, if you have a son or a daughter, just imagine that you live in Canaan. You live in the promised land, right? So you worship an idol, and the idol is displeased for some reason, so you're going to sacrifice your son or your daughter, which the Canaanite religion did. You know, archaeologically, they indicate that up to like four years old, they would sacrifice kids. Probably thousands of kids were sacrificed like that. Imagine you were an Israelite and that you did that because that's what Psalm 106 says. There were people that actually did that. Okay, take Johnny, sacrifice him. And they put him in, they had a, a big statue of the idol. The statue had bronze, you know, metal hands that were over, set over a fire. They put the child in the metal hands and the fire underneath would burn them. That's how they sacrificed. And, and the children of Israel did this. That's what Psalm 106 says. They actually did this. So that is what resulted from all those scriptures you read about. They didn't cast this one out. They didn't cast that one out. They didn't cast this one out. And they became thorns in their sides. And, they, um, and we read about that in the Old Testament, in, in the book of Judges. <clears throat> so um, life lessons. You know, <laughs> we do the same thing in principle. If... As Christians, when we turn to Christ, you know, we, we have the light of Christ in our lives. If we then turn back to old ways, like we read about in the book of Galatians, we're doing the very same thing as the children of Israel did in the book of Joshua when they didn't do what God told them to do, and it comes back to bite them, big time. And, and you're not, with Psalm 106, you're not talking about just an isolated disobedience that, you know, by the end of the day, it's okay. We're talking about generational disobedience. We're talking about disobedience that not only did it not result in godliness being passed on to the next generation, but it resulted in idolatry being passed on to the next generation, right? I mean, when you think about as fathers, husbands, the family subunit, whether it's just husband and wife or husband, wife, and kids, the family subunit is the spiritual subunit for the transmission of faith from one generation to the next. It is the laboratory. It is where husband and wife learn godliness, where kids learn godliness from husband and wife, right? That's where it happens. If Christianity doesn't go on to the next generation, probably the culprit is the family because the family is what does that. It's not, you know, Christianity is not passed on to the generation by megachurches. I'm telling you, that doesn't happen. It's by families. Family is the basic subunit of spiritual regeneration. Okay? That's exactly what the children of Israel did not do. They not only didn't pass on godliness, they passed on idolatry. They killed little Johnny. They killed little Annie. They sacrificed them to idols. 
So, but we do the same thing. I mean, we look at them and say, how can they possibly do that? But we do the same thing if we turn to Christ and then go back to the old ways again. They just become pricks in our eyes and thorns in our sides. Just exactly like Joshua 23 talks about. It's exactly what happens. Uh, and the, we'll close with this scripture, which it's uh, in the King James, it's evil communications corrupt good manners. But basically it's um, choose your friends wisely. <laughs> because you really, um, you become what you look at. You become your friends. You become your acquaintances. You become, if you have them, your hero. That's what you become. You become what you look at. You become what you consistently repeat in your mind and with your mouth. That's what happens in your life. So choose your friends wisely. Um, make sure they're Christian. Make sure they're maybe smarter than you are, <laughs> more godly than... If you're choosing a spouse, I encourage you to choose a spouse that's more godly than you are because it's, your, it's Mary above your pay grade, I'm telling you, man. Seriously, Mary above your pay grade. Um, and I think that's all I had here.